Rex Stout's Nero Wolf. Starring Mabel Moore as Nero Wolf and Don Franks as Archie Goodman. episode, Disguised for Murder, with special guest stars Lally Cadeau, Jack Creeley, Neil Monroe, Eric Peterson, and Fiona Reed. I had made two mistakes. When the president of the Manhattan Flower Club persuaded Nero Wolf to show his orchids to the members one afternoon... I should have fought it. This is a brassova, isn't it? No, sir, that's not a brassova. It's a lilia. Are you sure? And after the date had been set and the invitation sent, when Wolf had arranged that I should stay up in the plant rooms with him and Theodore to mingle with the guests, I should have put my foot down. Could I grow that on my coffee table? Is that a pansy? No, madam. I doubt if you could grow Miltonia on a coffee table. Sorry. Well, it's near a very sunny window. But I hadn't. As a result, it had been up there a good hour and a half, grinning around and acting pleased and happy. I'm so sorry. How clumsy of me. Oh, it's quite all right, madam. Your sleeve just happened to hook it. It'll bloom again next year. It was understood that the Manhattan Flower Club was choosy about who it took in, but uh, obviously its standards were different from mine. Oh, the men were okay, as far as men go. But the women... It would have been a relief to spot just one who could have made my grin start further down than the front of my teeth. There had, in fact, been one. Just one. Excuse me, miss. Are there any questions I could answer for you? About what? Oh, say, uh, about orchids. I haven't any questions about orchids at all. Eventually, feeling that the damn grin might freeze on me for good, I beat it down to the office poured myself two inches of bourbon and sat at my desk with my feet up. Ah. Hmm. Well, hello. Did you think of some questions after all? Could I have a drink? Well, sure. I got uh, scotch, rye... Anything. Bur- quick. Give me yours. Hey. Oh. Did I need that? Uh, you like more? No. You're Archie Goodwin. And you're the queen of Egypt. I'm a baboon. I don't know why they ever taught me to talk. Look at my handshake. I'm all to pieces. You do seem a little upset. When I saw you upstairs... I want to see Nero Wolf. Right away. Well, I... I want to tell him something before I change my mind. And then I'll get a job at Macy's or marry a truck driver. I want to see Nero Wolf. Well, I'm afraid that can't be done. Not until the party's over, at least. Are people coming in here? No. May I have another drink, please? Well, shouldn't you give that one time to settle? I'll help myself. (laughs) <laughs> You'll pardon me saying this, but for a member of the Manhattan Flower Club, you seem a bit of a screwball. I'm not. A screwball? A member. I see. I could tell you. Uh, many people have. I'm going to. Good, shoot. I'm afraid I'll change my mind, and I don't want oh, to. Okay, okay, now. Ready, go. I had a friend once, as close as a person like me ever comes to having a friend, mm-hmm. and a man killed her, strangled her. And if I told what I knew about it, they could have caught him. But I was afraid to go to the cops, so he's still loose. And she was my friend. That's getting down toward the bottom, isn't it? That's fairly low. Of course, I don't know you any too well. Uh, Why were you afraid to go to the cops? Because I'm a crook. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, what do you do? Uh, Steal orchids? No, certainly not. I wouldn't be small and I wouldn't be dirty. At least, that's what I thought. But once you start, it's not so easy. You meet people and you get involved, you know? Uh, Yeah, I know. I realized long ago that I'd made a big mistake. I wasn't what I thought I was going to be, a romantic, reckless outlaw. You can't do it that way, or anyhow I couldn't. About a year ago, I decided to break loose. A good way to do it would have been to talk to someone, the way I'm talking to you now. But I didn't have sense enough to see that. Uh, So you didn't uh, break loose? No, I kept putting it off. And then I met this man in Florida who had a lead, and we followed it up here just a week ago. That's what I'm working on now. That's what brought me here today. Oh, God. If only I hadn't come here, I wouldn't have seen him. 
Seen who? I should have looked away from him, turned away quick when I realized who he was. But I was so shocked, I, I, I couldn't move. Oh, God, how dumb could I be? I just stood there staring at him, thinking I wouldn't have recognized him if he hadn't had the hat on. And then he turned and looked right at me. And he saw that I knew. Oh, God. Mrs. Owen asked me what was the matter. And then I saw Nero Wolf, and it gave me the idea of telling him. And then I saw you going out, and as soon as I could break away, I came down to find you. There. I feel better now. Yeah, it's good bourbon. Is it a secret who you recognize? No. I'm going to tell Nero Wolf, then he can't touch me. Why not? Because I'll get Nero Wolf to tell him that if anything happens to me, he'll know who did it. You'll know, too. You'll both know. Well, we would if we had his name and address. He must be quite a specimen to scare you that bad. Uh, speaking of names, what's yours? <laughs> you like Marjorie? Uh, so-so. I used Devil and Carter in Paris once. Do you like that? It's not bad. What are you using now? Hey, come on now. You're not in a vacuum, and I'm a detective. They took the names down at the door. Cynthia Brown. Cynthia Brown. I like that fine. Now, upstairs, you were with two men and a middle-aged lady. That's Mrs. Orwin. Yes. And she's the current customer, then, the lead you picked up in Florida. Yes, but that's that's finished. Hmm? Since I'm telling you and Nero Wolf, I'm through. Oh, oh, the job at Macy's or marry a truck driver. Uh, who did you recognize upstairs? Can anyone hear us? No. No, that door goes out to the front room. Today, it's the cloakroom. Uh, this room's soundproof, including the doors. This has to be done the way I say. Sure, why not? I wasn't being honest with you. Oh, well, I wouldn't expect it from a crook. Start all over again. I I don't just want Wolf because I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I'm scared, all right, but I want him to get that man for murder. Will he do that? Well, he might. Now, what kind of evidence have you got? Have you got any? I saw him that day in her apartment. Whose apartment? My friend's, the one I told you about. I, I stopped in to visit her that afternoon. I was just leaving. Doris was inside the bathroom. And as I got near the entrance door, I heard a key turning in the lock. And that man came in. When he saw me, he just stood and stared. <laughs> I knew Doris didn't want me to meet her bank account, and of course I assumed it was him making an unexpected call, so I mumbled something about Doris being in the bathroom and got the hell out. Oh, God, if I'd known... I went and kept a cocktail date and then phoned Doris's number to ask if our dinner date was still on, considering the visit of the bank account. There was no answer. They found her body the next day. There wasn't a word about the man in the papers. No one had seen him come or go. And I didn't open my mouth. I was a lousy coward. And uh, you just saw that man again upstairs looking at the orchids? Yes. That's a pretty good script. Look, it is no sure? script. I wish to God it was. Okay. He looked straight at me, and his eyes... Yes. Archie? Yes, sir. What the devil are you doing down there? Come back up here. Soon I'm talking with a prospective client. This is no time for clients. Come at once. I have to go upstairs. Mr. Wolf sounds a little pressed. Do you want to wait here? Yes. If Mrs. Orwin asks about you... I didn't feel well and went home. Okay. Now, it shouldn't be long. The invitations say uh, 2.30 to 5. If you want a drink, help yourself. Or keep the door closed. Or what name does this murderer use when he goes to look at orchids? Come on, damn it. What's his name? I don't know. You don't? No. Well, describe him, then. You wouldn't believe... Not now. I want to see what neighbor Wolf says no, first. Look, if you can't trust oh, me... Oh, it's I'm... not that. Honest. Look... I might as well tell you. You'd never want any part of me anyway. This is the first time in years that I've talked to a man just straight. You know, just human. You know, not figuring on something one way or another. I've enjoyed it very much, Mr. Goodwin. You just call me Archie. But describe him for me. Just sketch him out. Not until Nero Wolf says he'll do it. You'll understand why then. I had to leave it at that. Upstairs in the plant rooms, Wolf shot me a look of cold fury, and I turned on the grin. I found the party Cynthia, if that was her name, had been with. Mrs. Uh, Orwin? Yes. 
Well, how did you know my name? The young lady that was with you. My sister? I guess so. You are... Colonel, Colonel Percy Brown. Yeah. Miss Brown asked me to tell you that she went home. I gave her a little drink. It seemed to help, but she decided to leave. Oh, dear. Oh, is she all right? She is perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with her. You should have made it three drinks. Three big ones. Just hand her the bottle. Be quiet, Jean. Certainly, Mama. Percy, uh, perhaps you should go and see about it's her. It's not necessary, Mimi, really. Yeah, she's all right. I left Mimi, Percy, and Jean and moved around among the guests, being gracious and keeping my eyes peeled. I had been known to have hunches. And it would be something for my scrapbook if I picked up the killer of Doris Hatton and it turned out to be Sunfast. Cynthia Brown hadn't given me the Hatton, only the Doris, but that was enough. The papers had given it a big play, of course. Beautiful young woman, no visible means of support, strangled in exclusive Manhattan apartment. A great deal had been made of the fact that the yellow silk scarf she'd been strangled with had the Declaration of Independence printed on it. I kept on the go through the plant rooms, leaving all switches open for a hunch, but it wasn't till nearly five o'clock when it happened. A guy at the north bench leaned over to pick up a plant, and I got a buzz at the back of my neck. It was the way his fingers closed around the pot, especially the thumbs. No matter how careful you are of other people's property, you don't pick up a five-inch pot as if you were going to squeeze the life out of it. Nice flower. What color do you call the sepals? Nankeen yellow. Nankeen yellow. How very persuasive. He put the pot back and marched off without another word. I followed him up to the landing and down three flights of stairs. There were only a few stragglers left in the hall, and Saul Panzer was at the door letting them out. My man went directly to the front room where Fritz was helping Mrs. Orwin with her coat. Could you hand me the brown tweed, please? Of course. Excuse me, but we're checking guests out as well as in. Your name, please? My name? Ridiculous. Stand aside, please. Problem, Archie? I don't know, Saul. I'd like to know that man's name. What the hell? What? What is it? What is it? Take care of her, Fritz. Fritz. I'm here, Arch. It's too late to send Fritz down the block for Dr. Volmer. Right. Oh, and no one leaves, Saul. Keep everyone that's left. Gotcha. Yes? Me in the office. You better come down. That prospective client is here on the floor, strangled. I'm sure she's gone, but I sent for Doc Volmer. Is this Flummery? No, sir. Come down and look at her and then ask me. Hey, you can't go in there. there. All right, don't don't come in here. Just on knowing what... My God. Yes, sir. How did it happen? Don't know. Who is it? Don't know. The man at the door won't let us leave. No, sir, and you can see why. Now, outside, please. I certainly can, but we know nothing about it. My name is Carlisle, Homer N. Carlisle, executive president of North American Foods. This is my wife. How do you do? How do you do? My wife is merely acting under impulse. I wanted to see the office. I didn't even go in. I'm sorry. We're both sorry. I'll do the talking, Ellen. Now, we have an appointment, and uh, there's no reason why we should be detained. Look, we're all sorry, but you can't leave. I insist. Look, if nothing else, your wife discovered the body. We're stuck worse than you are with a corpse in our office. We haven't even got a wife that had an impulse. What's going on there, Saul? This guy insists on leaving. Of course I insist on leaving. You can't hold me here. Colonel Brown, I'm afraid. Saul, stop him. The hell do you people think? You were warned, Colonel. Now, if you'll all... Guilt. What? Guilt. The compression got too great, and boom, he exploded. Who the... I was watching him. Who the hell are you? My name is Morley. I'm a psychiatrist. Well, that's swell. Now go back in the front room and watch all of them. With a wall mirror in there, you can include yourself. This is you can't hold me here. Right? 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 My appointment is I'm very... Now listen to me. Make me sick. Oh, here's me. My name is Homer N. Carlyle. I am president of North America. Be quiet. I only wanted to see your office up in there. She was on the floor. Archie, get this tigress off me. Ellen, stop it. Gosh. Madam, you have torn my lapel. My wife is distraught, sir. If oh, shut call... up. Distinguished group of sincere and devoted gardeners. Oi! So, yes, sir. Are you armed? Yes, sir. Put them all in the front room and keep them there. Let no one touch anything around this door, especially the knob. Yes, sir. Archie, come in the office with me. Good God. Yes, sir, it's not pretty. Sometimes you can do something, but it wasn't even worth trying. Long ago, can you guess? I saw her alive an hour ago. I would guess she's been dead about half an hour. Uh, finger marks? No, something soft like a strip of cloth was used. Say a scarf. You uh, haven't called the police? No, I wanted a word with you first. Very well. Report quickly before we call Inspector Kramer. (laughs) 
all. Yes, Inspector? You and Fritz were in the hall all afternoon. The hall and the front room, yeah. Who did you see enter or leave the office? I saw Archie go in about 4 o'clock. I was just coming out of the front room with someone's hat and coat. I saw Mrs. Carlyle come out just after she screamed. And in between those two, I saw no one enter or leave. We were very busy at that time. Mm. What about you, Fritz? I saw no one. I didn't even see Archie go in. Excuse me, Inspector Kramer. Yes? My duties here are of the household and not professional. Your men are still busy in the office. The front room is full of guests. And now here you are in my dining room. I need to know how long you are going to be in my dining room. Mr. Wolf needs his dinner. Well, I'll be goddamned. All this disturbance. It can't be helped, Fritz. How many people are left in the front room? Uh, Mrs. Orwin and her party, the Carlyles, and that uh, strange doctor, the psychiatrist. Have we plenty of ham? Uh, yes, sir. Sturgeon? Yes, sir. Later, probably. For the guests in the front room, but not the police. Are you through with Fritz, Mr. Kramer? Yes. Saul, you were at the door with Goodwin when that woman screamed and came running out of the office. But you didn't see her enter the office. Why not? We had our backs turned. We were watching a man who had just left go down the steps. Archie had asked him for his name, and he had said that was ridiculous. If you wanted, his name is Malcolm Vetter. What the hell it is? How do you know? I had checked him in along with the rest. Are you telling me that you could fit that many names to that many faces after seeing them just once? Hey, there's more to people than faces. I might go wrong on a few, but not many. I was at that door to do a job, and I did it. You should know by now, Mr. Kramer, that Mr. Panzer is an exceptional man. All right, that's all for now, Saul. Wait in the front room. Rokeliff, you heard the name Malcolm Vedder. Check it on that list and send a man to bring him in. Yes, sir. Jesus, there are 219 names on that list. Yes. This house won't hold that many. Not all at once. They came and went. Oh, great. Goodwin's story. I mean, the girl's story as Goodwin told You it. got it exactly as she told it to me. Sure I did. Nothing saved, nothing held back. No. What do you make of the girl's story, Wolf? Well, what followed seemed to support it. I doubt if she would have arranged for her death just to corroborate a tale. I accept it. I credit it. What do you know about the killing of Doris Hatton? Oh, newspaper accounts. Love nest killing in Manhattan's most exclusive apartment building. Who paid the rest? Something like that. Yeah. Why can't police find them? Are they protecting I don't them? read the tabloid. Three of our best men spent a month trying to start a trail. One of them is still working on it. Nothing. Not point one. Yes, I sympathize. Oh, you sympathize. Great. Well, maybe you can sympathize with the way I feel about the fact that Goodwin sat there in your office and was told that that man was right here on these premises. And did he pick up a phone and call us? No, he went upstairs and watched to see if anybody squeezed some flower pot. You're irritated, Inspector. Not that he was on the premises, but that he had been. Also, I was taking it with salt. The girl was a screwball. Also, she was saving specifications for Mr. Wolf. Also, also he... I know you. How many of the 219 guests were men? I'd say a little over half. And how do you like it? I hate it. Mr. Kramer... Something has occurred to me that does not seem to have occurred to you. Naturally, you're a genius. What is it? Something that Mr. Goodwin told us. I want to consider it a little. We could consider it together. Later. Those people in the front room are my guests. Can't you dispose of them? Yeah, I'd like to dispose of them. Let's see the woman who found the body. What's her name, Carlisle? <laughs> Inspector, my wife and I have been held here now for two hours. I know you have your duty to perform, but citizens have a few rights left, thank God. Now, why are we being detained? Mr. Carlyle, a woman was murdered here today. Well, that has nothing to do with us. I warn you, if my name or my wife's name is published in connection with this miserable affair, I'm in trouble, and I'm in a position to. Your wife discovered the body. By accident. May I say something, Homer? It depends on what you say. Oh? What do you mean by oh? I mean that I sent for your wife, not you. But you came with her. Why? Well, to protect her, of course. Does she need protection? Certainly not. I mean... Then why don't you just sit down while I ask her a few questions? You wanted to say something, Mrs. Carlyle. <clears throat> Only that I'm sorry for the trouble I've caused. There, do you see... Oh, I wouldn't say you caused any trouble exactly, except for yourself and your husband. The woman was dead whether you went in there or not. Now, I have to ask you some questions. If only as a matter of form, because you discovered the body... There's no question of you being involved more than that, is there? How the devil could there be? How long had you been downstairs before you went into the office? Oh, we had just come down. I was waiting for my husband to get his things. Had you been downstairs before that? No. Or only when we came in. 
What time did you arrive? A little after three, I think. At twenty past three. Were you and your husband together all the time, continuously? Of course. Well, you know how it is. He would look a little longer at something sometimes, and I would move on a little. We were together the whole time. Do you see what I meant, Inspector? My wife has a habit of being vague. This is. I'm not actually vague. It's just that everything is relative. For instance, who would have thought my wish to see Nero Wolf's office would link me with a horrible crime? My God, you hear that? Link, link. Why did you want to see Wolf's office? Why to see the globe? What globe? Oh, yes, it's famous. I'd read about it, and I wanted to see how it looked. A globe, three feet in diameter. Oh! What? I didn't see it. Well, you were distracted. Uh, by the way, did you know her? Had you ever seen her before? Y- you, you mean her? Yes, her name was Cynthia Brown. But we have never known her or seen her or heard of her. Had you, Mrs. Carlyle? No. Inspector, surely you can see how this has upset my wife. Haven't you asked enough questions? Oh, I suppose. For now. Thank you, both of you. We won't bother you again unless we have to. Roklip, pass them out. Oh, Inspector? Yes? I don't suppose... Uh, would it be possible for me to look at the globe now? Just a peek. Oh, for God's sake, Ellen. Come on, come on. Excuse me, sir. What is it, Roklip? Uh, we're all through in the office, sir. We've covered everything. Nothing is being taken away, and it's all in order. Uh, we were especially careful with the contents of the drawers of Wolf's desk. My I... desk? You went through my desk? Oh, yes. She was killed there. She was strangled with something, and murderers have been known to hide things. Did you get anything at all, Rokliff? I don't think so. Of course, the prints have to be sorted, and there'll be lab reports. Uh, how do we leave it? Seal it up, and we'll see tomorrow. You stay here and keep a photographer. The others can go. What? Have that woman sent in, Mrs. Irwin. Uh, Orwin, sir? I'll see w- Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're going to seal up, what, the office? Well, certainly. You don't mean that. We work there. We live there. All our stuff is in there. Go ahead, Lieutenant. Mr. Kramer, have you the effrontery it's routine. to... routine. That's a lie. It is not routine. It's my routine. Your office is not just an office. It is the place where more fancy tricks have been played than any other spot in New York. When a woman is murdered there, sealing it is routine. No, Mr. Kramer. I'll tell you what it is. It is the malefic spite of a sullen little soul and a crabbed and envious mind. It is the childish rancor of a primacy too often challenged and offended. It is the feeble wriggle of a word. Ah, I've been hearing about you for years. I'm Eugene Orwin. This is my mother. Inspector. My mother is not feeling well. At the request of your men, she went in with me to identify the body of Miss Brown. Oh. Take this chair, Miss Orwin. I would like to make a statement on behalf of my mother and myself. I hope you'll permit it. Mr. Orwin, I sent for your... I am a member of the bar. A statement would be welcome if it's relevant. I thought so. So many people have an entirely wrong idea of police methods. Mm, We come across that. Now, since Miss Brown came here today as my mother's guest, it might be supposed that my mother knew her well. But actually, she doesn't. That's what I want to make clear. Go ahead. Then here are the facts. In January, my mother was in Florida. You meet all kinds in Florida... My mother met a man who called himself Colonel Percy Brown. Colonel in the British Reserve, he said. Later, he introduced his sister Cynthia to her. My mother saw a great deal of them. My father is dead, and the estate, a rather large one, is in her control. She lent Brown some money. Not much. That was just an opener. But a week ago... It was only $5,000, and I didn't promise him anything. Mother, a week ago, she returned to New York, and they came along. First time I saw them, I knew they were imposters. He didn't sound like an Englishman. Certainly she didn't. I was in the middle of a yawn when Wolf passed me a slip of paper on which he'd scribbled, bring sandwiches and coffee for you and me. Tell Fritz to serve those left in the front room, no one else. I left the room, filled the order, and returned to the dining room with trays for Wolf and me. the others had gone because I wanted to persuade Mr. Wolf to sell me some plants. And after Miss Brown left you, your group was never separated at all? My mother and I were never separated, but I believe Colonel Brown did wander off by himself once or twice. I see. Well, I think that'll be off now, Mr. Orwin. You and your mother can return to the other room. You won't keep us much longer, Inspector. I think we'll be through quite soon now. I do appreciate your consideration. Good, when you told me you had seen Orwin and his mother separated from each other during the afternoon... Mm -hmm. Uh, pass the Dijon mustard, would you please, uh, Mr. Wolf? Here. Oh, thank you so much. 
Uh, yes, Inspector. I saw them separated several times. So he lied. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, the pepper, please, Archie. Oh, of course, sir. Thank is, you. is that imported mm. ham? Hmm? Oh, no, it's uh, Georgia. Fed on peanuts and acorns, cured to Mr. Wolf's specifications. Smells so good, but it tastes even better. I'll copy the recipe for you. Oh, no, damn it, I can't, because the typewriter's in the office. I am sorry. Rowcliffe, get that Colonel Brown in. Uh, yes, sir. That man you wanted, better? He's here. The flower pot strangler? And I'll take him first. Bring in Mr. Vetter, please. You know I can't make up my mind which of these sandwiches is the best, ham or sturgeon. So I like to alternate. First a bit of ham, then sturgeon, then ham, then... Typical. Typical of what? Typical of police clumsiness. Pulling me into this. The newspaper men out front recognize me, of course. And the damn photographers, my God. Why do they recognize you? I am Malcolm Vedder. Oh, yes? I am not unknown. I am currently starring in The Primitives on Broadway. Oh, an actor. Yeah, it would be tough for you having your picture in the paper. We need help, us clumsy police, and you were among those present. You remember this flower club? I am not, sir. I came at the kind invitation of a friend, Mrs. Arthur Beauchamp. And were you with this Mrs. Beauchamp this afternoon? I was not. Mrs. Beauchamp had to leave early to keep an appointment. I chose to remain to look at more orchids. If only I'd left with her, I would have avoided this dreadful publicity. Were you acquainted with Miss Cynthia Brown or her brother, Colonel Percy Brown? Did you see them upstairs? I saw no one that I had ever known or seen before, except for Mrs. Beauchamp. Did you know Doris Hatton? Who? Doris Hatton. Doris Hatton? She was also strangled. I remember now. Yes? God, imagine strangling a beautiful woman. Put out the light. What? And then put out the light. <clears throat> Did you know Doris Hatton? Oh, fellow. No, I didn't know her. I only read about her. Damn it all. I only came here to look at orchids. God. <clears throat> A little more mustard, please, Mr. Wolf. Your name, please. My name is Colonel Percy Brown. Which army are you in? I think it will save time if I state my position. I will answer fully and freely all questions that relate to what I saw or heard since I arrived here this afternoon. Answers to any other questions will have to wait until I consult my attorney. Hmm. Well, the trouble is, I'm pretty sure I don't give a damn what you saw or heard this afternoon. I want to put something to you. As you see, I'm not even wanting to know why you tried to break away before we got here. I merely wanted to... Forget it. Now, on information received, I, I think it's like... The woman who called herself Cynthia Brown, murdered here today, was not your sister. She was working with you on an operation of which Mrs. Orwin was the subject. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's only background. Otherwise, I'm not interested in it. My work is homicide, and that's what I'm working on now. I'm listening. For two months now, you've been on intimate terms with Cynthia Brown. Oh, she certainly must have mentioned an experience you had recently. A friend of hers named Doris Hatton was murdered. And she had information about the murderer. She must have mentioned that to you. Now you can tell me. Now, if you do, we can nail him for what he did here today. And it might even make things a little smoother for you. Well? I'm sorry. For what? I'm sorry. I can't help. You expect me to believe that during all those weeks she never mentioned the murder of her friend? I'm sorry. I can't help. I'm sorry, too. Okay. We'll go on to this afternoon. On what you said, you'd answer fully and freely. Do you remember a moment when something about Cynthia Brown's appearance, some movement she made, or the expression on her face, caused Mrs. Orwin to ask her what was the matter with her? Mm, no, I don't believe I do. I am asking you to try. Try hard. Well, I may not have been right there at the moment in those aisles in a crowd like we weren't rubbing elbows continuously. You do remember when she excused herself because she wasn't feeling well? Yes, of course I do. Well, this moment I'm asking about came shortly before that. 
she exchanged looks with some man nearby, and it was her reaction to that that made Mrs. Orwin ask her what was the matter. Now, if you saw that look and can describe the man, I wouldn't give a damn if you stripped Mrs. Orwin clean and ten more like her. I didn't see it. You didn't? No. You didn't say you're sorry? Well, I am, of course, if it helps. Oh, the hell with you. Levy, take him out and tell Steppens to send him down and lock him up. Material witness. And he's got a record somewhere. Find it. Yes, sir. I wish to phone my attorney. There's a phone down where you're going. If it's not out of order, take him, Levy. And tell the men to start gathering up. We're leaving. Everybody out to my office. But there's one more, sir. One more what? In the front room, a man. Who? His name is Nicholson Morley. He's a psychiatrist. Oh, let him go. This is a goddamn joke. Yes, sir. Clear up, Rochelle. Oh, before I go, Wolf, earlier you said something had occurred to you. Did I? Something in Goodwin's report of what Cynthia Brown said to him. Was that just before you ordered my office to be sealed? Come on, Rochelle. Let's get out of here. Excuse me, sir. That man Morley insists on seeing you. He says it's vital. What is he, a screwball? I don't know. He may be. Oh, bring him in. Come in, Dr. Morley. You have something to say, doctor? I have. Something vital. Well, let's hear it. The talk in the front room is that the murder of Cynthia Brown may be connected with the strangling some months ago of Doris Hatton. May I assume that is so? If you want to, why do you ask? And may I ask if you have a definite object of suspicion? If you mean, am I ready to name the murderer? No. Are you? I think I may be. Go ahead. Oh, not quite so fast. I must first make one more assumption. That these were not commonplace crimes with commonplace discoverable motives. Or the murderer would have been vulnerable to your very efficient police techniques. Now, assuming those techniques have failed, we must ask why. Must we? Okay, what? Because the most powerful motives on Earth are motives of personality, which cannot be exposed by any purely objective investigation. If the personality is twisted, distorted as it is with a psychotic, then the motives are twisted too. G get down to it. Very well. You know the names of all the people who were here today. I am willing to offer my services. I don't think there are more than three or four men in New York qualified for such a job. All you have to do is have them brought... Wait a minute. Are you suggesting that we deliver everyone that was here today to your office for you to work on? Oh, no, 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 no. Only the men, of course. There's an excellent chance that I can tell you who the strangler is, and when you know that... Excuse me. Sorry to cut you off, Doctor, but I have to get downtown. I'm afraid your suggestion won't work. I'll let you know. Come on, Rokliff. Mr. Wolf, you are intelligent and literate. I should have had you more in mind. May I count on you to explain to that policeman why my suggestion is the only hope for him? No. Mr. Wolf's had a hard day, so have I. Would you mind closing the door after you? Uh, but... Uh... This way, please. <sighs> They've all gone. Everyone. Don't look at the office door. I did. It's sealed. Malefic spite. Huh? Uh, well, this isn't a bad room to sit in. Archie, I want to ask you something. Yeah, shoot. Do you accept without reservation the story Miss Brown told you? Well, in view of what happened, yes. All right, then assume it. Assume that the person she had recognized followed her downstairs and saw her enter the office to join you. That he waited until you came out and went upstairs. That he took an opportunity to enter the office unobserved got her off guard, killed her, got out unobserved, and returned upstairs. All of those assumptions seem to me to be required unless we discard all that and dig elsewhere. Hmm. I'll take it that way. All right. Then we have significant indications of his character. Now, consider it. He has killed her and is back upstairs, knowing that she was in the office talking with you for some time. He'd... He'd like to know what she said to you, specifically whether she told you about him, and if so, how much. Yeah. Now, I put it to you. With that question unanswered, would a man of his character leave the house? 
or would he prefer the challenge and the risk of remaining until the body had been discovered to see what you would do? I'll be damned. He would stick around till the body was found. And if he did, then he's one of the bunch Kramer's been talking with. So that's what occurred to you that Kramer didn't get, huh? No, no, by no means. That's a different matter. This is merely a tentative calculation for a starting point. If it's sound, I know who the murderer is. Well, if you want me to get him on the phone, I'll have to use the one in the kitchen. I want to test the calculation. So do I. But there's a difficulty, huh? The test I have in mind, the only one I can contrive to my satisfaction, only you can make. And in doing so, you'd have to expose yourself to a great personal risk. Well, since one of you flinched or faltered in the face of danger to me. Oh, this danger is extreme. Well, so is the fix you're in. The office is sealed, and in it are the book you're reading and the television set. Now, let's hear the test. Very well. The decision will be yours. Pass me the Manhattan telephone directory and uh, an envelope from that bureau drawer there. Uh, take paper for yourself. Here you are. Now, take this down while I uh, look up the address. Uh, she told me who to send this to and more. I have kept it to myself because I haven't decided what is the right thing to do. Stop. I would like to have a talk with you first, and if you will phone me tomorrow, Tuesday, between 9 o'clock and noon, comma, we can make an appointment. Uh, please don't put it off, or I will have to decide myself. I gather from the grammar I signed my name. Oh, yes. Well, we could forget the calculation and send this to every guy on that list and wait and see. I prefer to send it to only one person, the one indicated by your report of that conversation, the one to whom I am addressing this envelope. There. That will test the calculation. And save postage. The extreme danger, I suppose, is that I'll get strangled. I don't want to minimize the risk of this, Archie. I'll have to go to Times Square right away and mail this. Uh, may I have the envelope, please? Of course. There you are. I don't believe it. I was with Wolf in the plant rooms the next morning when the call finally came. Nero Wolf's residence. Archie Goodwin speaking. You sent me a note. Did I? What about? About an appointment. Can you discuss it? Sure, I'm all alone. There's no extensions on. But I don't recognize your voice. Who is this? I have two voices. This is the other one. You made a decision yet? No, I was waiting to hear from you. That's wise, I think. You are free tonight? No, I can regular free. Drive the northeast corner, 51st Street, 11th Avenue. Get there at 8 o'clock. Park in the corner. You got that? Got it. You'll be alone, of course. Yeah. I still don't recognize your voice. You know, I don't think you're the person I sent the note to. I am. It's good, isn't it? Mr. Wolf, you saved a lot of postage. Ah, you have an appointment? For 8 o'clock. Get Saul. We have planning to do. By the time I left to keep the appointment, we had no less than seven contingency plans. I parked at the meeting place at 747 and cranked down the window for a good view of the filling station across the street. At 759, exactly on schedule, a taxi pulled in and stopped by the pumps. And the driver got out, lifted the hood, and began fiddling around inside. Saul was in the passenger seat. I rolled up my window and waited. A kid, barely old enough for high school, was motioning to me to roll down my window. You, Goodwin? Yeah. This is for you. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Come back here. Make no signal of any kind. Follow the instructions to the letter or there will be no meeting. Jesus. Goodbye, Saul Panzer. Hello, contingency plan number two. The instructions that followed gave a driving route so complex that even Saul couldn't have followed without being spotted, especially since I had a chaperone. 
A dark blue sedan followed my every turn for a full hour and a quarter that I drove in circles around New York till I arrived at my destination, a dingy warehouse near the East River. I parked as instructed in the note and waited. The sedan pulled up behind me and a rat-like little man got out and opened my door. Well, we got here. Yeah, hey, you damn near lost me a one light. You come with me. Contingency plans number three, four, and five went out the window when we entered the warehouse, went up two flights of badly worn stairs, and walked down a dingy hall to the rear of the building. In here. You sure that's him? What do you think? He'd be here if I wasn't. Okay, bud. Take off your hat and coat and sit in that chair. Hey, hold it. I haven't explained yet. All right, now the idea is simple. The man is coming to see you don't want any trouble. He just wants to talk. So we tie you in that chair, and we leave. He comes, you have a private talk. He leaves, we come back and cut you loose. Plain enough? It's too damn plain. What if I won't do it? Then he don't come, and you don't have a talk. What if I walk out now? Go ahead. We get paid anyhow. You want to see this guy? There's only one way. We tie you in a chair. Look, I don't want any trouble either. How about this? I sit in the chair, you fix the cord to look right, so I'm free to move in case of fire. There's a hundred bucks in my wallet in my breast pocket. Before you leave, help yourselves. A lousy sea. For Christ's sake, shut up and sit down. All right, suppose I show you what else is in my pocket. Here, like this gun. Ah, gee. And suppose we all go for a little walk down to the nearest police station. <laughs> okay, wise guy. And then what do we do? Hey, look. You either want to see this guy or you don't. Seeing how you got the gun out, I guess he's got to know you. I don't blame him for wanting your hands arranged for it. Make up your mind. Well, that was it. There were no contingency plans left. And I'd promised Nero Wolf that if this should happen, I would turn around and go home. Okay, I'll do it. But don't you tie him too tight. You know, I've been around the block and I can find you guys again if I care to. And don't think I can't. Just put a gun on the table and sit how long will I have to wait? You'll see. Not long. They did a really thorough job of tying my hands to the back legs of the chair and my ankles to the front legs. And they left. And I waited. But not for long. The door opened and my man entered. He was wearing a gray pinstripe suit and a dark gray homburg with a top coat over his arm. He had gloves on. Hello, Mr. Goodwin. Would you have known me? Not from Adam. Let's talk. So she told you about me? Yes. What'd she tell you? About that day at Doris Hatton's apartment, about recognizing you yesterday? She's dead. There's no evidence. You can't prove anything. Then you're wasting a lot of time and energy in the best disguise I ever saw. It's not too hard to get evidence if you know where to look. Yeah, but you haven't told the police. No. Oh, never a wolf. No. Why not? I'd like to quit the detective business. For 100000 I could do it. It could be arranged so you get what you pay for. How could you arrange that? We'll find a way. We'll have to, or you'll have me on your neck for the rest of your life. You threaten me? No, 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 no. Believe me. I don't want you on my neck either. No. I suppose you don't. Mr. Goodwin, let me explain my point of view. Go ahead. You're quite right, of course. I don't want you on my neck. Good, of course. But I don't not. want to pay you $100,000 either. All right. 90. I don't want to pay you anything. Yeah, that, that, that's not being reasonable. I'll tell the cops. I don't think and... so. Let me show you what I have in my pocket. Is that the scarf you killed Cynthia Brown with? Yeah, it is. You come one step closer and I'll yell. Oh, they're out of here, ain't Uh, keep in front of me. They won't be back for 15 Keep minutes. in front of me. Now, look. Hey, look. Look, it's no good anyhow. There's a note for you from Nero Wolf. In my breast pocket. Now, get it. But stay in front of me. You can't trick me. Don't you want to know what it says? All you have to do is reach. Hey, what can I do? Very well. There. Now, you see? Read it. Go ahead. If Mr. Goodwin is not home by midnight, the information given him by Cynthia Brown will be communicated to police. Oh. And I shall see the day after immediately. Right. See, it's no good. Now, he did it this way because if you had known I had told him, you might have just sat tight. He figured that you might think that you could handle me. I admit you tried your best. He wants that 100000 by tomorrow, 6 o'clock, no later. 
you get that much by then. Okay, he'll take your IOU. You can write it on the back of that note. My pen's here in my pocket. He'll be reasonable about it. I'm not such a fool. Who said you were? Now, use your head, that's all. We got you. A little thing like signing an IOU won't make it any worse. He won't press you too hard. Here, here, get my pen. No, Mr. Goodwin, you haven't got me keep, yet. Keep in front of me. You use that scarf and Wolf will tell the cops. Unless, unless I use it on him too. You, keep in front of me. Goodbye, mister. Keep in front of me now, I told you. What the hell's you going on here? You can't get away with it. What time does your watch say? Don't... 9.32. It's not 15 minutes. I told you to come back in 15 minutes. Yeah, huh? yeah, well, we got to think, and we want to be sure we get paid. I told you to come yeah, back. Yeah, well, we've had bad experiences before. $2,000 is a lot of money. Here, take it. Take it and get out. Don't take it. What's the matter? It's got germs. No, it's peanuts. You saps, it's peanuts. This guy's worth 10 grand to you, as is. 10 G's. That's a reward for him. Yeah, what are you talking about? Do you know who you got here? That's the strangler the police are looking for. You read today's papers? You see the scarf in his hand? Look, he's trying to hide it. Yeah, he's crazy. He's trying to make a fool. You want to know his name? I'll give you his name. Mrs. Carlisle. Mrs. Homer N. Carlisle. You want her address? Mrs. Did you say Mrs.? That's a woman. Watch her now. Keep her away from me. Keep her away. Don't let her touch me. Okay, pal. Hold it right there. Let me go. Jesus, it could be a woman. There's one way to find out. Yeah. Don't you touch me. Don't you touch me. Don't you touch me. Oh, I hope you're satisfied. You and Goodwin have got your pictures in the paper again. Got a lot of free publicity. I got my nose wiped. <clears throat> but you got no fee. No, no fee. I suppose you thought you could pry a fee out of somebody. That's why you suppressed evidence. Oh, no, Mr. Kramer, I suppressed no evidence. Okay, I can't prove it, but I know it. If she hadn't been described to Goodwin, how did you know to send that blackmail note to her? I explained to you. I concluded that the murderer was among those who remained. Yes, but why her? There were only two women who remained. Obviously, it couldn't have been Mrs. Orwin. With her physique, she'd be hard put to pass as a man. Besides, uh, she's a widow, and it seemed a sound presumption that Doris Hatton had been killed by a jealous wife. Who'd yeah, but why a woman? Why not a man? Yeah, yeah, oh, that, yes. Yeah. I told you in my dining room that something had occurred to me and I wanted to consider it. Yeah. Later, I would have been glad to tell you about it if you hadn't acted so irresponsibly and spitefully in sealing up this office. All right, all right. <laughs> that, that made me doubt if you were capable of proceeding properly on any suggestion from me, so I decided to proceed myself. Get to it. What occurred to you? Well, simply this. Uh, Miss Brown told Mr. Goodwin that she wouldn't have recognized the murderer if he hadn't had a hat on. So? She used the masculine pronoun naturally throughout that conversation because it had been a man who'd called at Doris Hatton's apartment that October day and he was fixed in her mind as a man. But it was in my plant rooms that she had seen him the other day and no man wore his hat up there. But nearly all the women had hats on, so it, it, it was a woman. I don't believe it. You have a record of Mr. Goodwin's report of that conversation? Consult it. I still wouldn't believe it. Well, there were other little items. For example, uh, the strangler of Doris Hatton had a key to the door. But surely the provider who had so carefully avoided revealment wouldn't have marched in at an unexpected hour to risk encountering strangers. And uh, who so likely to have found an opportunity or contrived one to secure a duplicate key? As the provider's jealous wife. You can talk all day. I still don't believe it. episode were Maver Moore as Nero Wolf, Don Franks as Archie Goodwin, and Cease Linder as Inspector Kramer. Lally Cadeau was Mrs. Carlyle, Jack Creeley, Malcolm Vedder, Neil Monroe, Colonel Percy Brown, 
Eric Peterson, Dr. Morley. Fiona Reed, Cynthia Brown. Denise Ferguson, Mrs. Orwin. Michael Tate, Jean Orwin. Henry Raymer, Homer N. Carlisle. Nick Nichols, Charlie. Jim Morris, Skinny. Alfie Scott, Saul. And Frank Perry was Fritz. Music was composed and conducted by Don Gillis. Technical operations by John Jessup. Sound effects, Bill Robinson. The production assistant was Nancy McElveen. And casting consultant was Ann Weldon Tate. Disguise for Murder was written and produced in Toronto by Ron Hartman. Next week. Why are you disturbing me, Archie? I'll be down at six o'clock. This is urgent. A question for you to mow. Well? What color do you like in shrouds? The doorbell rings at Nero Wolf's brownstone house on 34th Street. Who is at the door? Oh, uh, a man with an embalmed face. You know, what's this? You're taking your gun? Archie meets some unsavory characters. Hold it right there, Goodwin. Huh? No funny moves, Goodwin. That's a gun in his pocket. Is it the one he used last night? Don't be too smart. The head of the mob had a daughter. Was it Beulah? Hello, hello, hello. Hi there. I'm looking for Miss Beulah Page. Well, you found her. Are you a preacher? Or was it Angelina? I will not be diddled. This interview is over. I'm sure you'll give it your best thought. My God, is he fat. Nero Wolf is catapulted into a gangland war. And Archie is taken for a ride. Hey, you know, I usually hate to be driven by a woman driver. But you're good. I thought you would be. You're very good. <laughs> I can turn corners and back up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my building just ahead. You wouldn't con me, would you, Dumpling? If you still think Parrot and Wolf framed it, you're batty. You don't know Wolf. I don't know you either. So, uh, let's see what we can do to fix that up now, huh? We'll huh? leave the car here. Later, I'll come we down and drive you home. Come on. A Angelina, uh, Miss Murphy, I don't think you... Uh, Dumpling. What? This isn't Halloween night, is it? No, it's not. Really. Then why is that guy in the car wearing a mask? Get down! Ah! Next week, Rex Stout's Before I Die, with guest stars Jane Eastwood and August Challenberg. is CBC Stereo.